Welcome to Third Eyesight. I'm your host, Juan Francisco, and I'm a spiritual intuitive who practices tarot card reading and mediumship. I've always been super curious about the supernatural and paranormal, and I'm here to share my stories and interview folks who want to share their own stories. Let's get to it. I'm joined by Mark Horn, the author of Tarot and the Gates of Light, A Kabbalistic Path to Liberation. Mark, it's so great to have you on the podcast. How are you doing today? Uh, thank you so very much for having me, and, and I'm doing uh, very well since uh, I've just retired from corporate America. Wow, congrats. That's that's, that's an amazing milestone. And it will tell us where are you based, and what is your life's work, or what are you retiring from, and what's your passion? Uh, well, uh, I am based in New York City. Uh, I live in on Manhattan's Upper West Side, um, and uh, my corporate job for basically uh, the last 45 years has been in advertising as a copywriter. Uh, but my life's work and passion has really always been tarot. Uh, I didn't always understand that. I always understood it as a passion. I didn't understand it as my life's work until, oh, I'd say the last 10 years. And I've been sort of slowly making the transition away from corporate work to uh, be being a full-time tarot reader. Did you actually start reading um, reading as a service to the public within the last 10 years? Oh, gee, when you say as a service to the public, as, as a business, it, it's only been the last 10 years. Uh, you know, I, I didn't charge for many years. I really just read for friends, uh, for casual acquaintances. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I, I'd get calls from people because uh, friends would say, oh, I had this incredible reading. You got to meet this guy. And so I would be introduced to people who, who'd want readings. And uh, and eventually, you know, it, it became really clear that I was very good at this and, and um and that it would uh, be uh, probably a good thing to sort of make this uh, a profession. Yeah, and we're definitely going to delve into that. And I'm so curious to hear, and for folks to hear how Kabbalah intersects with the traditional Rider Waite Smith deck. But first, I wanted to ask you, what was your first interaction with the tarot deck? And, and how did you realize you had a knack for reading the cards? Well, this is a little bit of an odd story and, and maybe a little bit of a long one. So feel free to interrupt at any moment. I, I, good. Get, I get into story mode. I was 16 years old and a member of an organization uh, known as SCA, the Society for Creative Anachronism. And um, they uh, used to hold uh, medieval tournaments in complete costume uh, with jousting and uh, medieval dancing and all this sort of stuff. And I, I, I came across them at a science fiction convention because where would you actually meet people fascinated by the past, but at a convention for uh, people who are fascinated by the future? And most of the people, in fact, who founded uh, uh, SCA were science fiction writers, oddly enough. So I was a member of this organization and uh, I uh, first saw tarot cards there. Uh, and in fact, I had uh, gone to one of the founders' homes because it was 1969, and I was uh, about to borrow uh, their tent to uh, go up to the Woodstock Festival in upstate New York. And before I went up, um, she just said, why don't I give you a tarot reading and we'll find out what this is going to be like for you. And I was excited by that. And she uh, laid the cards out and she looked at them and she looked at me and she looked at the cards and she said, you know, this is not really about the week. I, you know, this seems to be about your life in general. And I think you would be, based on what these cards seem to show, an excellent tarot reader. And uh, that thrilled me because I was fascinated by the images on these cards. They called to me as soon as I saw them. And I just thought I had to know more about them. And, and of course, you know, the images, at least on the, on the, the Wait Smith deck, you know, they are very influenced by uh, medieval and Renaissance imagery. And I was already somewhat interested in that. So, and, and as a literature major, the, the symbolism of the Renaissance and the Middle Ages really spoke to me. I, I felt like tarot cards were kind of like a warehouse of Western symbolism. And I wanted, you know, and I feel like they, they spoke to me. So I wanted to learn all about them. And so when, when I, I said, yes, I'm interested, she recommended a couple of books and, and she told me what deck to get. And, you know, within a few weeks, I was reading for other people. Wow. And I know that 
your book has a lot of this biographical information in it. So saying, you know, someone should write a book about that. You've done it. But I feel like this is the makings of uh, this. It's just like <laughs> if I, there was a film about how you discovered Tara, it would be so cool to, to see that. And that's just and and OK, there's a lot. So the founder of, of SCA, the Society for Creative Anachronism, and then Woodstock, it's like. I bet people listening are like, whoa, that is so so much coolness in one one that was one year of your life. It was also the year, you know, uh, that the Gay Liberation Front was founded and the Stonewall riots, and when I sort of came out into gay politics, um, you know, 1969 was a major year in my life, and so much changed. So much changed. I'd say it laid the tracks for the rest of my life. Can you give us just for a quick moment? Uh, a, a, a peek into what the first Woodstock festival was like. What was it like being there? <laughs> I could imagine it was a lot. <laughs> well, but, but you know what? You know, everybody, you know, looks at looks, looks at the the pictures in the movie, and it looks all very romantic and exciting. And in many ways, it was. But everybody does know that there were thunderstorms and it rained a lot of the time. But most people don't realize that in upstate New York in the summer, overnight it gets very cold. And um, the, the field we were in um, was a pasture, a cow pasture. Uh, so uh, it was filled with um, um, cow droppings uh, and the rain uh, turned the entire slope into a, a, you know, a mud shit slide. A mud, uh, I was going to say a mud slide, but worse. Oh, goodness. Oh, yeah, no, that's kind of what it was. So it, it was really uh, stinky. And uh, and then, of course, you know, there were all these porta potties, which uh, they didn't really have enough of them because they didn't expect a quarter of a million people to show up. So really, by the first day, all of them were overflowing. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> it was a summer of love and putting up with shit. That's yeah, it, 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 it really was. It, it really was. So, you know, when you ask for a memory of Woodstock, you know, what I would say is, um, Santana's Soul Sacrifice, which I, I still watch the video of this performance because it is mind blowing, and and the the miserable weather. Wow, wow. Well, I I think you and I messaged because I I went to the to Bethel Bethel Woods. I, that's the name of the town, right? And I went to the side of the Woodstock Festival, and I, I was thinking of you while I was there. And I think when I put up my picture, you messaged me, and it's just it's. Yeah, as 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 nasty as some parts of that experience probably was, as as it definitely was, um, it's just it, it is it's such a momentous part of U.S. history and music oh, history. Uh, well, you know, I, I saw so many great bands, and uh, you know, just as you know, sort of being in in the Society for Creative Anachronism sort of gave my life a direction. Um, you know, I went to the Woodstock Festival. I was this sort of lower middle class nerdy kid from Brooklyn, but I had a friend um, who was who I'd met through uh, the science fiction world, uh, actually through a Star Trek fan club, and uh, she was working at the Fillmore East as a uh, uh, an usher and living with a commune on the, on the, uh, in the East Village called, if we can say this, uh, the Motherfuckers. And, uh, and so uh, she said, we're, we're all gonna go up on a bus to Woodstock, why don't you come along? And I thought this would be fun. So off I went, you know, really not knowing what I was getting into. And, um, and I went from being sort of the nerdy outcast kid in high school to being the coolest kid uh, because I was the only kid in, in my high school who, who was there. What an experience. Wow. Well, jumping back into your work of tarot, in, in the years you've done readings for people, whether um, uh, whether for pay or for not, is there one experience, maybe there's many, but if there's one experience you could think of that has really stood out to you as memorable in a reading, if you feel comfortable sharing? Well, I'll give you two experiences because one is about a reading and one is sort of about a book and I'll, the book, and I'll tell you about the book experience first which is, you know, as, as an author, you get letters from people who uh, read the book and you get email from people who've read the book. And I got a letter uh, that had gone to my publisher and uh, the return address was a, a prison, a penitentiary in Arizona. Uh, it was from a, uh, a young trans woman who was uh, incarcerated in a men's prison in Arizona who had uh, somehow come across my book in this prison and read it and did the work of the book. 
so that uh, what she wrote to me was about how doing the work of the book changed her experience of being incarcerated. Wow. How she was better able to cope with the situation and how she felt better prepared for what life would be when she got out. And I, you know, of course, I, I don't have a name or any contact information because when you send a letter from a prison like that, it's only an, a, a prisoner's number and the, and the prison itself. Uh, so that's as much as I know. It was a handwritten three page letter, which just blew me away. And I felt like if, if my book has done nothing else other than to have positively affected this person, you know, there was a reason for me to have done this. And, and if, so it was very, it was a moving experience for me. And, and this is, and it's really why I wrote the book because I wanted to do it to help change lives for the better. To sort of receive that feedback from this rather extreme situation was just profoundly moving. That, that gets me emotional and gives me chills. That's, that's absolutely incredible. And, you know, you ask about, you know, what um, experience I've had actually doing readings. Well, you know, there are the, you know, the readings where you kind of had that sort of spooky moment where it's like, because, you know, I don't, I don't think of myself as psychic. And I tell people I'm not a psychic. I don't tell the future. Um, although what I say is, you know, we, we can see possible futures from what the cards show. But sometimes something comes through. And when it does, um, I have to say it, but I also have to say to people, okay, um, I don't generally do this, but sometimes something comes through and this is what I'm getting. So I'm, I want you to know this is what I'm getting and I'm gonna tell you what it is, but that doesn't mean it's accurate. But on occasion, stuff has come through that has been as you know they say, really sort of ooh, twilight zone moments. <laughs> you know, outer limits moments. And, um, and then of course you just see things. You know, I, I was doing a reading about two years ago for a, a man at a, at a tarot conference. I did not know him. Uh, he came up to me and he was clearly nervous, but he had a question. And um, he asked and uh, some cards came up and I looked at the cards and one card in particular came up in a particular arrangement. It was the nine of wands. And I, sometimes I, when this card comes up, uh, it is the card of somebody who is in the closet. And I, I had a sense, you know, from talking to this guy that that was in fact what his question was really about. But you have to be very careful because, you know, people don't always want to reveal themselves. That's some of the reason why they ask these questions. And so uh, I, I said, is it all right if I ask you a very personal question? He said, yes, please. So I said, um, are you in the closet about your sexuality? And he burst into tears because that was entirely what he was asking about. He wanted to know um, if indeed he really was gay, he was wrestling with it and how to deal with it. And once he could talk about that, we could actually talk about what the cards showed for him and, and how he could have a path forward so that he could accept himself and love himself for who he was. And that was, you know, that was very meaningful uh, for me. And when those things happen, um, it's just, it's just a, a very meaningful moment. Uh, earlier this year, I, you know, something like that, I, a woman asked a question about, she said, because um, she knows I, I don't answer questions about health. So her question to me was kind of vague. She said, um, uh, can you tell me, you know, uh, about my family, whether we're going to be happy? That was kind of broad, but I thought, all right, we'll go with this. And I put the cards out and I looked at the cards and I, I something came through and I said, all right, this is a hard question to ask. Um, I'm, is it okay if I ask you a very personal question? And she said, yes. And I said, are you having trouble conceiving a child? And she burst into tears because that was what she was asking about. Um, she, you know, she is married, but she doesn't have a family yet. She was basically trying to ask, will I have a, will I have children? And even though it wasn't what she asked, the cards spoke to it. And, and I, I felt nervous asking if this was what was going on. And when she uh, uh, confirmed it, 
uh, then of course, now I had to actually talk about it and what the cards showed. And as was I said to her, just because the cards say something doesn't mean it's actually what will happen. This is, these are possibilities. And there are always ways you can change the cards. I, I, I also often tell people, uh, you know, sometimes people get a, a reading and they see a lot of cards that are reversed. And some people ask, oh, if a card's upside down, does it change the meaning? Well, some people read reversals, some people don't, and some people change their mind based on the circumstances. I'm in that third category. Based on the circumstances, I decide how I'm going to read it. Uh, but sometimes when the cards are upside down, and I know that that's how they need to be read, what I tell people is cards also are about magic and intentionality. So if you see something in an upside down card that you don't like, when the reading is over, let us consciously say you are going to change the energy around this and turn the cards right side up. So that simply by making the affirmation that you're going to change the energy around it and turning the card around to do so as a statement of you're going to do that is a kind of magical intention. And for some people, it works very well. Wow. I've, I've never, because I work with reversals and I'm also in that third category of it depends on the intuitive feeling I'm getting. Yes. But what you just said about at the end of a reading, reversing the reversal <laughs> uh, um, and, and letting that be an act of uh, a way of, of uh, an affirmation of itself to reverse the reverse card. Yes. That's really powerful. I've never, uh, I, that's the first time I hear someone share that, that, that method. One of the things that's important for me to, to let people know is that cards don't take away your agency. They're information that you can use to act and to change your life. So that, um, you know, I don't want people to come away from a reading feeling hopeless, that they can't do anything, that, you know, it's written in the cards. That's what it is. Uh, no. Um, well, sometimes. It, it is, um, you know, when you get, you know, six or seven or eight or 10 major arcana cards in a reading, you know, there's a lot of powerful energy around this and that then most likely um, it's out of your hands. But those cases are very rare. Right, right. And, and going back to those two readings you described where you had, uh, you felt the need to ask those not easy questions to ask. I think that 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 was the key is that you asked for permission, and I I feel like I've I think I've I have some memories of witnessing um, some intuitive workers who do not do that, and they just come right out with it. I think it was in a group reading once that I was in, or maybe it was a personal one on one reading, and I, that's so important to ask for that permission. It really is very much so. Uh, you know, I think that uh, as uh, readers, uh, we are in a we're we're put in a position of trust, and and ethics are extremely important for, for tarot card readers. They're, you know, on my, on my website, I have a page entirely devoted to what I will and won't do, uh, boundaries and, uh, and secrecy and, and how private things are. There are things that, you know, I will never reveal. Uh, there are, you know, I've done, you know, I mean, not to boast, but I have done readings for quote unquote celebrities. There are people who are, quote, celebrity readers, and they like to talk about who they've done readings for. My feeling is this is private inner work. You don't share it with others. If someone wants to say, hey, I got this great reading from Mark Horn, you should go see him, that I'm, I appreciate that. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking to use somebody's celebrity for my advertising. You know, that's not, that's just, it doesn't feel right. Right. I 100% relate to that. Although I've never read people of that of that um, status in culture, but I, I I would probably feel the same way, and I I really appreciate that. So your book is called Tarot in the Gates of Light: A Kabbalistic Path to Liberation. Could you share with us uh, what are the Gates of Light? What is that concept? Well, so uh, it's a reference to a book that was called Gates of Light that was written in the uh, 13th century uh, by a, a Spanish rabbi who was in the circle of the Kabbalists who wrote the Zohar, uh, the great uh, uh, Kabbalistic uh, classic, uh, perhaps the most central work of, of Kabbalah. 
Um, but uh, perhaps the second most famous work in, uh, in the Kabbalistic tradition is this book called Gates of Light. And it is a reference to uh, the 10 sefirot. And this is a Kabbalistic concept. Um, there is a, a concept called the tree of life. And there are these what we'll call uh, spheres on the diagram. They look like circles. Um, and they're called sefirot. Uh, they are energy centers. If you were to think of it as sort of analogous to the chakra system, um, these energy centers are in our own bodies, but they are also everywhere. And each energy center has its own characteristics and qualities. And uh, you can think of them as um, uh, the diagram of the tree of life as a step down transformer of how the energy from the divine makes its way down into manifestation. Because if you were to try and sort of fit, you know, they say you can't look on the face of God and live, right? Uh, so this is the way, you know, divine energy moves through these uh, step-down transformers until it comes to the world of manifestation and something that we can interact with. And, um, the, the rabbis taught uh, in Kabbalistic practice that you could work with the sefirot uh, internally and externally as a way of purifying your soul. And uh, the reason the book is called Tarot and the Gates of Light uh, is because uh, the tarot deck has a connection to Kabbalistic teaching. And the cards that are numbered one through 10 in the uh, minor arcana in the four suits are in fact connected to the 10 sefirot. Uh, and, and in fact, one of the things that has uh, come out through scholarship in the last 20 years is that the very first uh, book that was written of uh, interpretations of the meanings of the tarot minor arcana by a, uh, a French uh, occultist uh, who took the name Itea, which was actually his own name, Aliette, uh, written backwards, all of his meanings uh, come uh, directly from phrases that were in this Kabbalistic work called Gates of Light. Did he know this? Probably not, because what he said was that he learned all of these meanings from a traveling Italian uh, card teacher. So uh, did the Italian know this? We don't know. We don't have a smoking gun that shows how these things came together although I have been spending a lot of time over the last seven years really studying as much as I can where, for all, where all of these things came together. Uh, and in fact, uh, I have a, a candidate, I think, for the, the person who may have been at the center point for where these things came together uh, in the uh, mid-15th century. But do I still don't have a smoking gun. Uh, I just have some good... What, what do you call that? Circumstantial evidence? That's exciting to hear. I did not know that you were trying to find how there, this intersection occurred. And, and when it comes to, uh, if you could describe for our listeners, what is counting the Omer and, and how does tarot play a role in that? How does the deck play a role? So counting the Omer is a Kabbalistic practice. It is um, a, a traditional Jewish practice. Before it was Kabbalistic, it was actually, it's a biblical commandment. Uh, back in the days uh, 2,500 years ago when there was a, uh, a temple in Jerusalem, uh, it was part of the temple practice to, between the holidays of Passover and Pentecost to bring a sacrifice of barley grain to the temple for that 49-day period every day. It was an agricultural holiday. And when the temple was destroyed, the rabbis thought, well, but it's still a commandment in the Bible. How do we do this if there's no temple to bring this to? And they decided that mystically, the thing to do would be first to still count the days and to bring a different kind of sacrifice, an internal sacrifice. It was about, uh, they decided that uh, the goal would be to purify one's soul by working with 49 different sephirotic combinations over this period each day, Kabbalistically, so that on the 50th day, Pentecost, uh, one is ready for the ritual that takes place on that day, which is, um, uh, as you know, Pentecost is 
also a Christian holiday. It became a Christian holiday, uh, but it was originally, and it still is a Jewish holiday. And Pentecost in Judaism is the day uh, 50 days after the ancient uh, Hebrews left Egypt, uh, enslavement in Egypt, and 50 days later, they arrive at the foot of Mount Sinai, and they all hear the voice of the divine. Of course, you know, then all the Israelites say, oh, this is too much for us, Moses, you go to the top of the mountain, we can't handle this, it's too much for us. But everybody heard the voice. And in fact, it was not only the Israelites, because the, the enslaved people were not only the Israelites, but a mixed multitude. And the, the um, tradition is that really the souls of all humanity were present for that moment. So that if you are attracted to this, it's because somewhere in your soul memory, you remember this event. Mm -hmm. And the goal of purifying your soul in, uh, in the Jewish practice, uh, when you're counting the Omer today, is so that on the holiday of Pentecost, when we stay up all night waiting for our own personal revelation in meditation, that you have purified the channels in your soul so that you're more able to directly hear the voice of the divine. That's what it's about. And if you can do this practice for the 49 days and really sort of open the channels, your experience on that 50th day will be amazing. And I know this because I've done it myself and, and people who have done the practice and who've written me um, tell me amazing things. Uh, and in fact, there is a, a group of people, I, I love telling this story. There's a group of tarot people in Albuquerque, almost none of whom are, are, are Jewish, uh, but they're tarot people. And they got my book uh, three years ago when it came out and they decided as a group, they would do this practice together. And they met weekly to discuss how it was going for them for seven weeks. And at the end of the seven weeks, they all wrote me to say, this was a very powerful experience. And in fact, they have now done, this is the third year they're doing it. Wow. Uh, they do it every year annually. And, and uh, they've asked me to come and speak to them about it. And when the practice ends in a couple of weeks this year, I will be there uh, the day after to sort of hear all their experiences again and share my own, it is, um, as I said, it's profoundly moving. And I am so grateful that I've been able to sort of bring this practice, which is, you know, when I first learned about it about 25 years ago, I, you know, because it's not even a very well-known practice in Judaism. So to be able to bring this practice to a wider group of people and share its benefits, I'm just really grateful that I, I've had this um, opportunity. Yeah, and what an impact, the feeling of having that impact on people, I just can imagine how surreal it might feel to know that there is a book club of tarot readers or a group of tarot readers in Albuquerque, miles and miles away, who are telling you how impactful your book is. Yeah. And so what does day one of doing this practice looks like? I don't want to give everything away because I want, I want folks to learn even more through your book, but what does day one of counting the Omer with the tarot deck look like? Uh, the, the first day, so we work with, the, in, the, in this practice, we work with cards in the minor arcana that are numbered four through 10. We don't work with the ace, the two, or the three, because we work with the lower seven sephirot, which means uh, the fourth through the 10th uh, sephirot, which, and they correspond to the fourth through the 10th numbered cards. So on day one, um, you are dealing with a, a card that is numbered four, and um, I, this may be a little complicated to explain, but uh, you're, you're working with a, 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 a two sephirot in, um, in combination. And the first day is in fact, the same sephirot, double, same sephirah doubled. So it is chesed within chesed. Chesed means love. It's not romantic love. You can think of it as divine love or flow or creativity or benevolence. It is this energy, you know, when you say my cup runneth over, it is this overflow of blessings. And we start with this overflow of love and blessing and recognition of love and blessing in our lives, because it is the first day that one is free from your spiritual Egypt. And, uh, and, and this is about sort of getting free of your inner Egypt. In Hebrew, the word for Egypt uh, is Mitzrayim, uh, and it means the narrow place. And it has always been interpreted psycho-spiritually, 
not merely uh, that it is a narrow uh, place in between the, the, the banks of the Nile, but you were sort of in a constricted psycho-spiritual space. And the, your first day is your first day of freedom from this space. So it, it unleashes this great deal of joy and love and gratitude. And so you start with joy and love and gratitude. Um, and you work with the cards that have these images on the, on the, the, on the four cards. And you sort of investigate your response to the images and your relationship to these feelings. And it's good to start with joy because if you've read the, the story of the Israelites going through the desert, that you know, you know by the second day, all of the ancient Israelites are complaining to Moses, we're gonna die here in the desert. And, and then Pharaoh's chariots come after them and they're at the edge of the Red Sea and they're all convinced they're gonna die. And then when they get to the other side, even after that miracle, they're convinced they're gonna die of thirst in the desert. So it's about really learning to face your fears and all of the stuff that you've been carrying and all of the lies you've been told about your life. It's about freeing yourself from these scripts and lies and beliefs that hold you back spiritually and learning to recognize them. Uh, and so the first day is very easy but it, it gets a little harder. A and it's good to start easy because you know it's gonna get harder. Wow, what a journey. And thank you for describing that. And as you were sharing how tarot engages with this practice, I'm very curious to hear when you delved into this work of having these two, um, I mean, they are not separate realms as, as we have learned from you, but what people may consider se separate realms of worldviews or spirituality, um, one may be considered a little more traditional than the other. That's debatable. I guess in our mainstream culture today that people might see tarot as being untraditional or new agey. I don't prefer that phrase. When you started delving into the intersection of these practices, what was the feedback you received from your communities? Uh, or was, was it very, were people very receptive to it? What were people's feelings about it when you shared this with them? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because of course, as you say, there are different communities here. Um, you know, there's the tarot community and the tarot community knows, uh, or many people in the tarot community know that there is a connection between uh, tarot and Kabbalah. In fact, I knew it when I was 16, except that um, because I'd walked away from Judaism when I was 13, I had no interest in learning about any of the Kabbalistic stuff. And also the way it was taught was very abstruse and abstract and highly mystified. And that just annoyed the hell out of me. So I just wasn't interested. Uh, it wasn't until I came back to Judaism in my 40s and started learning Kabbalah from a very different point of view that I began to understand, oh, I can put these two things together. And what was really interesting was the, the tarot people who knew Kabbalah, most of them, the overwhelming majority of them were not Jewish. And then those who were Jewish knew nothing about counting the Omer. But because I had gotten really deeply into mystical Judaism, I'd learned about it and thought, wait a second, you can put the tarot and this practice together. And the first time I tried it, must have been around 2006, it blew my mind. And when I started to talk about it in the tarot world, people were interested. Um, but as I say, you know, they didn't really know much about Jewish practice or really traditional Kabbalah. They knew more sort of occult hermetic Kabbalah, which is somewhat different. And in the Jewish world, well, you know, tarot uh, is not exactly, to, to use a word that really doesn't apply here, kosher, um, you know, uh, and nevertheless, um, after I wrote the book, I uh, circulated the manuscript uh, to a number of rabbis because it was really important to me that I get good feedback that I from them that I wasn't saying anything that was sort of incorrect traditionally. And I wanted to see whether they felt that I was really on the right track. And I was very gratified to discover that even there was a rabbi who I, I always respected. And when I first told him about this, he was really dubious. And uh, after he read the book, 
he recommended everybody in the class that he was teaching to read it. And he said, he described it as uh, real Torah, you know, wow. and, and that I was just blown away. Uh, so to have, uh, to get uh, sort of um, endorsements from tarot teachers that I have always admired has meant a lot to me. And to get endorsements from rabbis blew my mind. Uh, obviously uh, not any Orthodox rabbis, but what I will tell you uh, is that, you know, because I've gotten a reputation in the Jewish community, I've actually had Orthodox and Hasidic um, clients come to me um, who I didn't want anybody in their community to know that they were coming for tarot readings, but they came. And they came because they knew that I was coming at it from a very respectful Judaic point of view. I am. I feel really also moved by the trust that they they give me uh, to be able to read for them, and also I I'm able to sort of speak to them in a language that is that makes sense to them. It's interesting because you know there, there's a woman I've been in, in correspondence with. She's just got her book is I think just coming out, and it's about Christianity. And, and tarot. And, and of course, remember, you know, the tarot is, is a product of, uh, you know, Renaissance Italy, basically, uh, which is about as, you know, Christian as you can get. Uh, and there's a lot of Christian symbolism in the, in the deck, uh, just as there is a great deal of Jewish symbolism. As, as I say, it's, I think of it as the warehouse of Western symbolism. It's all in there. And anything you want to find, you probably can and then make something of it. And she is also dealing with the same issue because there are many Christians who look at the tarot and say, this is the work of the devil. Right. But the reality is it is a spiritual tool for reflection and inner work. And uh, it's what it's, and as I say, like a tool, it's what you make of it. Uh, you know, a, a, a blade can either be a scalpel that you use to uh, uh, sort of, uh, do a procedure to save somebody's life, uh, or it's a knife that you can stab somebody in the heart. It's just a tool that goes either way. It's what you do with it. And the tarot is exactly that. It's what you do with it. And my uh, approach to it is holy. I could, wow, that was very insightful. And I could have said what you just said about how it is a tool and you use it as you'd like to. I could have said that better myself. Your book also refers to, um, shifting gears a bit, to your work in the early gay activist movement, which you referred to before. And I love to hear how your work in gay activism, how it has intersected with your spiritual journey and your work of tarot. So uh, in Judaism, there is this uh, concept. It is a Kabbalistic concept called tikkun olam. It means repair of the world. And uh, it is the belief that, so... Uh, I don't want to go into a very long explanation of this Kabbalistic Big Bang theory, except to say that um, it is human beings are considered partners of the divine in the work of perfecting the world. Jews don't believe that we have original sin, um, but, um, but there is uh, an understanding that the world was created imperfectly. And it is all, it is our work, it is our destiny um, to find and fix all of the imperfections that we are called to. You know, a Kabbalistic rabbi once said to me, the reason you move to Japan is because there are fallen divine sparks that are yours to find there and raise up and help bring healing to. And if you are working sort of consciously Kabbalistically in the world, you are always looking for ways to repair the world. From a, an activist point of view, and I'm now gonna sort of go uh, sort of to Jewish history in America, you know, uh, Jews were sort of at the, at the center of the union movement and a lot of social justice movements. And that's because um, many people have, have interpreted this Kabbalistic work of repairing the world as activism and social justice work. So oddly enough, my work in activism 
has always felt as part of my spiritual path. And um, can and connect, although when I first you know, started being an activist, I had walked away from Judaism um, because you know, in the 60s, it was not particularly gay positive, but I culturally, this is, I grew up with this understanding of social justice, which is rooted in the freedom of the enslaved Israelites. One of the things that it says in the liturgy of Passover is, you have to remember that you were slaves in Egypt and you must treat the stranger with justice and kindness because uh, of the way that you know you were treated. You have to not, you have to sort of make things better. And and I've always, regardless of walking away from the religion when I was a teenager, I've always believed that. You know, that is sort of the, the Jewish version of the golden rule. And, uh, and it really sort of influenced my work in activism. So to sort of come back to it full circle in Kabbalah and see how it is taught as something that you are supposed to do in terms of social justice or all different kinds of things. Well, you know, that's part of the work. And, and one of the great um, teachers, um, uh, once wrote in, in the in the work. There's a, a, a kabbalistic work, uh, the wisdom of our ancestors, and there's a rabbi who wrote, "It is not your job to finish the work, but that does not mean you are free from doing it." And it is a recognition mm -hmm. that we may never in our lives, just as Martin Luther King said, "I may not get to the other to the top of the mountain. I may not get to the other side of the river." but I'm working to make certain everybody else does. And that's what this rabbi was saying. And I understand that, you know, the work that I do, I, you know, I mean, I didn't ever expect to see gay marriage in my lifetime. Um, and I may yet see it uh, turn back in my lifetime, but I understand that it is an ongoing process and, and that it, that this process will continue beyond my life. And it is on my, it is my responsibility to, to continue to do the work, even if I never finish it. I think that just goes to show that nothing that we do in life is really separate from our spiritual journey, is it? Yes. Um, thank you for sharing that. But what, was, what was your favorite part of writing your book? And what was the biggest challenge? Ooh. Well, I'll talk about, well, so my favorite part was always when, as I was working and all of a sudden I would get this new insight and I would jump up and literally run around the apartment because I was so excited about something that I just discovered either about myself or something about the card. I, I, I was, you know, it was it just a pleasure uh, to do. Uh, the hardest thing about the book um, was in fact, uh, in fact, it was terrifying. And sometimes I was thinking about this just yesterday. So here we are, you know, the uh, the Supreme Court is now this uh, right-wing horror show and heaven only knows what's going to happen politically in the country in the next few years. And, you know, and I was well aware that when I was publishing this book, that I was writing about um, being a gay activist and, uh, and, and writing about the civil rights movement and how important this was as, as spiritual penance for the United States um, and, uh, and, all that we, and how we have not lived up to our own ideals. But as we say, as you say, you know, the work is never finished, but you have to talk about it. And so I'm talking about sort of this spiritual work, which some people would say is the devil's work. And I'm talking about my sexuality, which some people say is sin. And I'm talking about left-wing politics. And, you know, for the right, I am everything. I, I think I really sort of am a symbol of everything they want to, uh, you know, get rid of. You know, I'm a, a left-wing um, Jewish, Buddhist, uh, homosexual uh, activist, right? Um, and, you know, I mean, I read a story in, in, in the paper the other day, you know, I mean, God, you, you, we read about all these shootings and there was a story in the paper the other day about somebody who was driving around, who was arrested, you know, who was looking for uh, gay people to shoot. 
And, uh, and my, you know, I'm always worried, you know, I think you put this book out and you are making yourself a target. Uh, now, the reality is most people who are gonna pick up my book are probably not looking for me, right? They're not looking to shoot me because we're not talking about, you know, I'm not a big media personality, uh, but I am public about who I am. And, in a, and now I'm on a much wider stage and before the book came out, I began to wonder, is this safe to do? Hmm. Are you out of your mind? Is this dangerous? Like, I, you know, I was scared uh, for a while. And then I just decided, this is who you are. This is important work. And, and I was, and in fact, you know, as I said, I, you know, I came out in, in uh, you know, the, the era of the Stonewall and there were all these, I, I was 17. And there were all these people who were my elders who, you know, they, I was in high school and college, they were already in the work, the workforce and out in the world. And they were being public about who they were and not afraid to lose their jobs or be attacked because all of these things were real possibilities and happened to many people. And these people were my heroes when I was a teen. And I thought these were the people who I looked up to. I can do no less but to follow their path and be as open uh, spiritually uh, as they were politically. Wow, that was just really moving to hear. Yeah, that's, whew, no, it, it is, it's, a, it's a great reminder of that it is, it is possible, it's necessary to do that work and it is, it's possible to do it and come out on the other side as well. And like you said, even if we don't see the work done in our lifetime, and as you said, it's never really done, there's that hope that you're adding to, you're not only adding to the good for society or for people who are involved in your community, but you're also just adding on to that authenticity that you're living your life with. And there's nothing more joyous, nothing more important than that. Thank you so much again. And if you could indulge me with this last question before we wrap up. Uh, in your book, you mentioned, I think in the 60s or the 70s, you try to uh, achieve astral projection. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a very fascinating topic to me. I actually intend to do a podcast episode on what and what astral projection hold on, is. Hold on, hold on just a second. So I just, uh, you, you'll be able to see this as we're on video as we're talking about this. I just picked up this book. It cost me a lot of money since it's out of print. Um, the title is uh, Astral Projection, Ritual Magic, and Alchemy. Oh, that's right. You posted this on your social right. the other day. Yes. And it is actually, these are some of what, what had been in the past, the hidden writings of people who were members of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Uh, and I was particularly interested in reading uh, essays by uh, Moina Mathers, uh, who was the first initiate of the, of the, of the order. Uh, she was uh, the, the wife of uh, Samuel uh, McGrether Mathers, little McGrether Mathers. And uh, she was uh, the ritualist uh, of the group. And her writing is uh, very influenced uh, by Jewish Kabbalah because she grew up in a Orthodox Jewish family. And a lot of the stuff that comes into the Golden Dawn through her is actually pretty traditional, uh, but most of the people in the Golden Dawn had no idea of that. You were asking about astral projection, and, and th that's in this book, but I, I tried it when I was 16 years old. I, I, I wish I could remember the name of the book or even find it. It's out of print, um, but it had detailed instructions on how to do it, and it was about this man's experience. And I... Uh, tried the practice and um, I had an experience, uh, but I was terrified by that experience. Uh, and that's because I was able to sort of experience being out of my body in an astral body, being able to look down on myself and being able to sort of move around and see some things, but wow. I couldn't control the movements very well. And because I couldn't control anything, it was terrifying to me. Uh, you know, I didn't know, you know, like, could I get back in my body? Could, you know, what was going to happen? I just didn't know. I just thought this was dangerous. I, you know, I didn't have someone to do this with who was experienced. And I, I just felt like 
it was probably not for me. So I put it aside. Um, I don't blame you. (laughs) I mean, nowadays, you know, know, there was a book that I read uh, a few years ago, uh, which was about my meditation teacher's teacher. And uh, one of his students, uh, and this teacher lived in uh, uh, what is now Yangon, Rangoon. And this student uh, lived in uh, Michigan. And they had uh, studied together in the, I think the thirties or the forties or something. And then, you know, they lived in different countries, but they met every day on the astral plane. And this book is a sort of a record of their astral conversations, which they would, after they would have them on the astral plane, they would write to each other about their experiences to sort of check if they were in fact really doing this. And uh, and it, when I read it, I thought, oh yeah, this is astounding stuff. And if I had been able to do this with uh, uh, Sayagi Ubakin, this uh, great teacher, um, I would have loved to have done that, but I, I, he probably would not have uh, accepted me as a student. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I it fascinates me because I, I have family members who have experienced either seemingly involuntarily during a past life regression. I know someone in my family like saw their mother in another in their home country cooking dinner and later asked, hey mom, were you cooking dinner just now? Were, were you cooking this? Yes, yes, yes. And then uh, I had another family relative who had uh, it, uh, very intentionally astral projected and just fascinating to me. But yes, I, I had my own experience where I was stargazing and looking at the moon uh, after star looking at the stars and focusing on the moon and intending to go to the moon <laughs> as woohoo as that sounds. Um, and I remember seeing the moon. I was I closed my eyes and I saw the moon grow larger really fast, and I got too scared and I came back. <laughs> I don't know. I, I maybe I was imagining. I don't know, but it felt very real. And uh, I haven't done it since, and I don't intend to unless I consult with somebody. But thank you for indulging me with that no, no, story. No, no. My, my pleasure. Um, as I say, you know, it is one of the things that helped me understand um, that there are realms beyond my daily experience, and that um, I don't always feel comfortable in these realms. Um, but I, you know, I have respect for people who are able to sort of move within these realms. Uh, with expertise and comfort. Right, right. Well, tell our listeners how they can learn more about you and what your website is. Uh, so uh, first of all, the book, once again, is A Tarot and the Gates of Light, A Kabbalistic Path to Liberation. But you can find me online at gatesoflighttarot.com. Uh, just, you know, put Gates of Light Tarot into uh, your search engine of choice, and I will probably uh, come up first on your uh, a search. Uh, possibly even a story in the New York Times, which I'm uh, grateful to uh, someone for. And um, uh, there's also, I'm also on Instagram. If you look under uh, Gates of Light, uh, I think that's Gates of Light Tarot. I think it's just Gates of Light Tarot, I'm not certain. Um, Also on Facebook, you just look for uh, Gates of Light Tarot and, and I'll come up. Wonderful. Well, Mark, thank you so much for conversing with me today. I so appreciate it. My, my pleasure. I, it's an honor, and I, I'm grateful uh, to uh, be a part of your journey, actually, because I'm, I guess, I, you know, I, I can see that you're very powerful at, at some things that I know nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to, I'm going to say this, I wasn't going to say it because I didn't want you to feel uh, like I'm fluffing your feathers or anything. But uh, Mark is a very big reason I delved into tarot, I had bought my tarot, my first tarot deck, uh, November 2019, the pandemic happened. Mark and I talked about his book, and then I just, I, I my interest just expanded and and increased. And so I, I owe a part of my journey and what I'm doing today to meeting you. So thank you. It's my, it's an honor for me to have you on my podcast. We are all signposts for each other. 100. Thank you, Mark. Mm-hmm.